Hi, my name is Mark Small and you're watching Sen Unplugged. This week we're going to talk about the Children Families Act. Now, there's a high possibility that you've had or been having a very difficult time navigating the SCN system. And let's face it, local authorities are pretty terrible. Often parents are confused about what their rights are under the, what's called the Children Families Act. And that's the legislation that governs how local authorities make decisions in respect of a child's special needs and disabilities, and importantly, how those difficulties are going to be supported. Now, the purpose of, of these videos is to give you a guide as to what you can expect um, when you're asking the local authority for support and to understand the basic principles of the Children and Families Act. If you need further information, then you can access that through the Send For You website or the Facebook group at Send Advice. So let's look at the Children and Families Act. Now this is a real difficult piece of legislation um, because it's so broad in its scope. It covers children and young people from 0 to 25 and it replaced what was called Statements of Special Educational Need and Learning Difficulty Assessments and those applied to children who were attending school and young people attending colleges of further education. Now, when the Children and Families Act was implemented, it was designed not only to consolidate the two different legal systems, but to ensure there was continuity of support for children and young people from birth up to the age of 25. So let's look at some of those core duties under that legislation that are going to be important for you to understand. The SEN Code of Practice provides a useful overview of the legislation and it puts it in layman's terms, um, which, which is a lot easier to navigate than perhaps the actual legislation itself. So let's look at the Children and Families Act first of all, and let's look at some definitions. So this legislation applies to um, children and young people aged 0 to 25. So children obviously are 0 to 16, and in those categories, Parents, the child's parents, have responsibility for making decisions. They can request what they call EHC needs assessments, they can seek information from the educational setting, and they have the power to be able to deal with the statutory agencies, including health, social care and the local authority. But what this legislation does differently is it also confers rights on what we call young people. And young people under the legislation are age 16 and above. And where, where a young person reaches that age, they have the rights to request assessments, they have the rights to be able to liaise with health, social care and education, and they can do so without their parents being involved. Um, one of the key issues for parents and carers to consider is whether a young person actually has capacity to make decisions. Whether they have capacity or not depends on the application of what's called the Mental Capacity Act. Now, without boring you and going into too much detail, mental capacity is essentially, um, does the person understand the decision that's in front of them if it's communicated to them in a way that they're able to access. Um, so everybody has the right to make poor decisions, unfortunately. The next thing that local authorities have to do as well is ensure that they work in a collaborative manner with other statutory services including health and social care. So for example they have to share information, they have to ensure that assessment processes are aligned they have to jointly commission services for children and young people with special needs and disabilities and they have to jointly produce what's called the local offer. If you're looking for information and support, the first port of call must be the local offer. This is maintained by your local authority and it will generally be um, viewable online. So if you go to your local council's website, you'll be able to see the local offer. What it will then set out in detail are the processes for perhaps funding, uh, school support, the funding of further education, uh, the criteria for carrying out assessments, and it will also pinpoint lots of services that you'll be able to access um, for your child. The local authority has to produce the local offer in consultation with parents and carers, and it generally has to do this on an annual basis and, and ensure that the local offer is updated. For the first time as well, if a young person has what's called an education, health and care plan, they have the right to ask for a personal budget. And the personal budget can be used to pay for the special educational needs support that's required, either in the educational setting or otherwise. So for example, it can fund 
home to school transport. It can be used to fund perhaps mentoring outside of school. Um, and all local authorities are required to have a policy on how the personal budget can be applied. So if you're interested in a personal budget, then the first thing to do is to go to the local authority's website and download a copy of their personal budget policy, if you can find it. If you can't find it online, then simply ask the special needs team for a copy of it, and it sets out how you make an application and what you do if the application is refused by the local authority. I often get asked questions about the duties that schools or educational settings have to observe, and I'm often told that they're not doing something or that the information that are being given is wrong. The Children and Families Act sets out some really clear duties that schools and educational settings have to have, to have regard to. So the first thing to note is there is a general category of SEN, which is called Additional Support, and that replaced what was called School Action and School Action Plus. Um, those previously were different stages of the Code of Practice, which would prescribe different levels of support. So now educational settings have a lot more freedom to be able to determine the children that receive support under the SEN framework. Now all educational settings receive delegated funding to be able to meet the needs of children and young people with SEN. And it's up to the educational setting as to how they spend their money. But they have a number of duties that, um, that you should be aware of. But the first is that they have a duty to use their best endeavours to identify uh, children who present with difficulties in school. They have a duty to ensure that teachers have received appropriate training and that there's relevant continuing professional development. They have a duty to ensure their resources are used appropriately to ensure that children with SEN are having their needs met. And the government notionally says that all educational settings should provide uh, the first £6,000 worth of support. Um, now that, that is described as being notional, so if your school is telling you we don't have that support, then that is often a reason to trigger an EH needs assessment and to look to getting the child support through an education, health and care plan. Um, but normally the local authority will expect the educational setting to involve professionals. So the EHC needs assessment should not be the first time they see a professional. They should be seeing professionals in their educational setting on an ongoing basis and putting in place support for them. The other thing the school, the other thing the educational setting has to do is publish information about the SEM provision that it has available. So if you were to go onto your local school's website, um, it should set out in detail how they identify children and young people with SEM and the provision that they typically provide through their existing resources. And that's an important port of call for you if you've got concerns about your child's progress. Importantly, the Children and Families Act um, introduces support to children and young people, subject to them being eligible for an education, health and care plan. Now, before a child is eligible for an education, health and care plan, they have to have had what's called an EHC needs assessment. Now, the EHC needs assessment is an assessment of the child's education, health and care needs. It's carried out by the local authority and the local authority is required to consult with educational settings, health and social care in compiling that assessment. The assessment process takes six weeks. Parents can make a request um, at any point to the local authority and that request is usually made in writing. Some local authorities use a prescribed form. Um, the important thing is just being able to navigate who you have to make that request to and that information is available from a local offer. Now, if, you are, if your child's needs are assessed, then the next step is whether they're eligible for an education, health and care plan. And the education, health and care plan essentially provides them with the additional support that's needed to access education. And it's really important that you understand what needs to go into that education, health and care plan. Now, we have other videos that are going to be specifically tailored to the EH needs assessment process and the education, health and care plan. So we won't go into too much detail today. An important principle from the Children and Families Act is that all children and young people are required to be educated in mainstream settings. Under legislation, if a child does have an education, health and care plan, then that gives a number of rights to parents. So, for example, they can ask for a personal budget for th to deliver the support that's specified in the plan. They can also ask for a number of schools to be named in the plan. So, for the first time, Parents and carers have a right to express preferences for a range of educational settings and they include 
state schools, primary or secondary, those include academies and free schools, further education colleges, sixth form colleges, non-maintained special schools and independent specialist schools or colleges that are approved under section 41 of the Children and Families Act and the Secretary of State for Education holds a database of all the schools and colleges that are approved and you can view that from the DfE website. Where a child has an education health and care plan the local authorities are required to review it on an annual basis with the educational setting and at that annual review they can decide whether the support that's been provided has been adequate, they can decide whether more support's required and they can decide that the EHC plan is no longer necessary and in those circumstances they can, do, they can cease the EHC plan but they would only do that if the child or young person no longer needs special educational support. The legislation also introduces um, rights for you to be able to challenge local authority decisions. So, for example, if they refuse to carry out an assessment, then you have a right of appeal to what they call the First Tier Tribunal, Special Educational Needs and Disability. That is an independent process from the local authority, um, and you have that ability to challenge that decision. There is also the right to be able to ask for mediation. So, if you've had a particular decision that's been raised, then you can use mediation services to negotiate potential changes with your local authority. Now it's important to say that is a free service for you to access and all local authorities have to commission independent providers of that mediation. Um, we're going to be doing some more videos so stay tuned um, to our YouTube channel. Um, comment, like, subscribe, share. Um, if you're interested in further videos then they're going to be available through the YouTube channel and also through our Facebook page at Zen Advice. I'm Mark Small, I'll see you later.